on this side of Beth Ai, a lot of us wanted to be astronauts. And we were really lucky to bring Jean-Francois here to the stage. So give a big hand to a really big astronaut. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to share with you. Uh, I, will, I will, in a short time, present to you what I think it takes to be an astronaut, what is it like. And I, s I will say a few words about, uh, to expand on what uh, Laura said about giving access to the space experience to non-professionals. To be an astronaut first, as you see, it's to be a team. I mean, this is uh, my last uh, flight uh, shuttle crew to repair the Hubble Space Telescope. <coughs> I will expand just a bit. One slide per, per bullet, a few key words and pictures. Uh, about adventures and the risk and the uh, psychological, physiological challenges. And, uh, and then I hope we can discuss more when we have the uh, question and answer sessions with you. Test of adventure. It is not reserved to heroes or to test pilots or now in the core of the astronauts you have uh, people that were in their previous jobs, veterinarians, volcanologists, oceanographers, uh, astrophysicists, scientists, you have divers, uh, uh, heart surgeon, for example, Chiaki Mukai, Japanese female astronaut. She's a heart surgeon. She flew twice. And here you see uh, the only non-pilot walking on the moon, Jack Schmidt, a geologist who picked up the best stones brought back from the moon, actually. The risk, anytime you take energy, you take a risk. Uh, especially in terms of altitude, we call that potential energy or speed. Anytime you take altitude or velocity, you take a risk. And in the case of space flight, this is the extreme of altitude and energy. So uh, the risk is there. In space, we are exposed to vacuum. It's an extreme environment, hostile. And um, we, we lost two crews on the Russian side, two crews on the US side, only on ascent or entry. We never lost astronauts in space, in orbit, although we, we had uh, big events, uh, big catastrophic events in space like Apollo 13, the fire on board Mir, uh, a big collision and loss of one third of the atmosphere on board Mir also, but each time the crew was able to, to save their life. Uh, to summarize the big sensations of going to space, first, this is a huge power on liftoff. You don't know where you go. This is probably the only time in uh, transportation where you don't go to a physical point. We aim in space a virtual point where there is nothing physical waiting for us. We must be there at a certain time, at a certain speed, in a certain direction. But when we ignite the engines, you don't know where you go, but you feel you are going somewhere. In your life, you know, <laughs> you, you will remember forever this. The Earth is probably what strikes the astronauts the most for the rest of their life, but also you, you hear about weightlessness. And something strange, it is not obvious until you do it for the first time, you are on the daily side of the Earth and the sky is just black. Black, you don't see any stars. The Moon, the Sun and the Earth, no stars. To see stars, you need to think about something that some astronauts have forgotten to do and they have not seen stars from space. You have to switch off all the lights in the cockpit when the sun and the earth are in the back and wait your, for your eyes to adapt and then the blackness of, of the sky becomes white of stars. They don't twinkle because we don't see them through the atmosphere but then you realize we are probably not alone in the universe. But if you don't do that, you think you are alone in the universe. The challenges are due to the complex task. Rendezvous in space is totally non-intuitive. You have to accelerate to slow down. And that's true what I'm saying, and you have, you have to, to, to learn that. Uh, spacewalks, uh, you know, flying the robotic arm, that was my task on the first and my third space flight, are, uh, you know, uh, technical, complex task. Uh, but eventually, when you make the robotic arm or the space shuttle itself, your spaceship, being like an extension of your own body, uh, you, feel, you feel well in space. You feel this is your, this is your life and... Uh, you, you want to stay longer because you, you feel well. You can live, eat, drink, uh, and uh, you can perform well. And you, you, uh, you like space at the end, not like in gravity when uh, Sandra Bullock says, I hate space. This is not the <laughs> case. 
we accumulate things in space. We don't train much about this. And eventually, uh, it's a big mess. And uh, you have to learn to manage uh, thousands of objects every day. But eventually, we, we learn how to be better organized. We have now a, a coding system for location for objects. And uh, we, um, we barcode everything we touch now. And we don't lose any more objects like we did in the past. You have to accept to be a guinea pig. For people exploring your own body, you learn a lot about your own body. And it doesn't hurt, but it, this is a because you feel you serve science one way or the other. Of course, the, ch the psychological challenges are due to the confinement. You are in a small spaceship, isolation. You are far away from people that can rescue you. And we are obsessed by malfunctions. We think we are going to have malfunctions, and we are going to find solutions. This is the way we are trained. The, the, and, and people ask us, are you afraid you are when you are go in space? So this is just my definition. Fear is when you face the unknown. You don't know what's next, where you're going. But in our case, we know where we go and we know why. Your mission is to repair the Hubble Space Telescope. And several months in advance, we train for this. So several months in advance, we know that in our life, that day, at that time, the things I will do will be to sit on that chair doing that task on liftoff and then in space doing that task. When it comes, it is normal in my life because I prepare myself for that. So it, it, there is no place for fear. If I take you now and put you in space tomorrow, let's say even after tomorrow, you have good reasons to, to be afraid uh, and to fear what's, you're going to, what's going to happen because you don't know. You're not prepared. But thanks to Laura, we are well prepared. <laughs> this is teamwork. This is uh, on Christmas Day, 1999. I was uh, detaching the Hubble Space Telescope from the cargo bay of uh, Space Shuttle Discovery. Uh, we deployed the Hubble Space Telescope, and that was our best uh, Christmas gift because the, the ground controllers sent commands to activate the telescope, and the 13 different equipments we replaced on board were all working perfect. So we gave life back to the telescope, which was in survival mode at that time because it couldn't work, couldn't point any stars anymore, and uh, we were quite happy. But uh, So teamwork, this is my bullets. We need to accept a common goal for all of us. We don't do our job well to please the commander, to please the boss. We all want to reach the objectives. We want to come back with a successful mission. And for this, we need to show we are competent. We know our job. We communicate. This is the only way to get mutual trust between crew members. And at the end, we are like a Superman as a crew. We can face any situation. We know we will find the solution. A bit like Laura said, this is a John, Young, uh, John Young's uh, world, prepare for the worst and hope for the best. In the simulator, the instructors uh, are quite nasty. They are not allowed to give us scenarios with no solutions, but we can, they can invent the worst scenarios. Sometimes we have a propulsion leak with an air leak, with a fire on board, with a short circuit on the electrical system, with sparks, and uh, the control sticks, which doesn't respond, and we have to find the solution. Early in the training, we are, we are not so good. We need help from Houston. Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> but close to launch, we are Superman. I mean, they cannot, they cannot catch us. We, we are on top of everything, and we feel that we can go to space. We are ready. We train in a real situation, like T-38 flying. Uh, we train in a full flight simulator. Here I am in a, in a spacewalk suit in a real vacuum chamber. Recently, uh, I trained... Uh, and uh, on the sea floor to reproduce the Apollo 11 mission from beginning to end, exactly the same task uh, Neil Armstrong did with the same tools. So we prepare for future exploration by doing what we call analog training. Life on board is like a <laughs> camping trip, <laughs> just like camping, sleeping, um, you know. We even have pillows. The pillows has no, you know, if you remove the pillow, the head will be at the same place. <laughs> But astronauts, they like to feel the pillow. When you see the Earth in its globality, you can't help yourself thinking it's a spaceship, like our own spaceship. And I can tell you, uh, on board our own spaceship, we care about the, the oxygen we consume, the water, the electricity. And when we look at the Earth, we, we think it's a spaceship. And we are all crew members of that spaceship, and we should care. 
So we are explorers, that's true, uh, to the service of humankind, but uh, I want to remind that we are still men and women like everybody else and we need support from there, from, from our peers. We need support from the family or friends or colleagues or even from fans. You know, whatever exploration type you do, underwater, climbing or surfing big waves like Garrett, you need support. You, you cannot do, be a good explorer if you don't have a kind of support. Now I'd like to launch a small video. It's a business I started. Uh, we can lower the sound just a bit. Uh, it's the parabolic flights I introduced uh, 15 years, 25 years ago in Europe, the very first ones. And I uh, worked for a few years to get special authorization to open those kind of flights to the public. Laura showed you the same kind of flights for research, for professional people. But now we have people on board flying just to experience space. I mean weightlessness, not totally space, just a weightlessness part. For about 6,000 euros, you can float and feel uh, Mars gravity, Moon gravity, G, uh, zero G uh, effect. So we started the first flights this year and it's very successful. There are a, a very long waiting list of people who want to experience the space, uh, what it is like to be in space in weightlessness. Some people saving money for a long time, some people very rich, some people having already bought their, their ticket for Virgin, Virgin Galactic suborbital flights. But I guess this kind of flight will become more and more common. It is not magic, this is real weightlessness, exactly the same weightlessness we have in space. We literally put the aircraft in orbit, but we cannot fly along the whole orbit because it goes through the Earth. But for, uh, for 22 seconds at a time, we are weightless. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> uh, I hope... Uh, more people want to go to space now, I hope. Okay, we do a survey here. Who wants to go to space? Uh, good. Thank you.